Hello, everyone, and welcome to 3 o'clock with SOC. Give me just a second so I can welcome those who want to access the program in Spanish to our conference call with Spanish interpretation. Buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí en 3 p.m. con SOC. Como siempre, ustedes pueden escuchar el programa en español a través de una llamada de conferencia. Y el número aparece aquí en la pantalla y es 646-749-749. 3122 y el código para entrar es 779-328-221. Y ahora les voy a dejar con nuestra querida Marlene, quien va a ser nuestra moderadora de hoy. Um, thank you for letting me do that. I'm going to leave you in the hands of our beloved Marlene, who is going to be the moderator for today. Hi everyone and welcome to 3 o'clock with SOC today. Um, I am Marlene Zaron. I am the Public Health Coordinator here at the Southside Organizing Center. Um, so today is the COVID-19 day and we will be um, move, moving forward to give you more details on that. We've got a great guest for you guys for today. Um, I just want to say that the staff and platforms of SOC are still available to you and to the public. Um, but we are only doing things on a virtual level. Uh, so if you need any resources or you need any um, contact information for those resources, we can definitely help you out with that. Our phone number for SOC is 414-672-8090. And you can also um, email us at soc at socmilwaukee.org. Uh, if you have any questions right now, and then you can also visit our, visit our website at www.socmilwaukee.org where you will find our uh, COVID-19 information and any resources you need for COVID and also um, anything related to any updates for the current election. So that being said, I want to... Um, go ahead and uh, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our acknowledge our um, our survey for SOC so we would love for you guys to complete our uh, SOC survey essentially we get feedback of the SOC from this survey for SOC to help us better understand what topics and what uh, we could imp improve with the SOC forum. Uh, so I'm currently working from home. As you can see, I'm not wearing a mask. Um, and if I were in the office, I would be wearing a mask. Uh, so I want to just take the moment to, you know, let everyone who's currently watching say hello in the comment section. We love to know who is here and who are our avid uh, viewers for SOC. So if you could comment hi or your favorite emoji, that would be great. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions shared today do not necessarily reflect those of SOC. So today is the COVID-19 day. The feature segment today is Marlena Jackson. She's the interim commissioner of, public, of the public health department right now. Um, and she's here today to talk about COVID-19 with us. We've got a vast array of different topics that she's going to clarify with us, and um, we're very excited to have her. Um, and it's her first time on with us um, since the um, Commissioner Kowalik has left. So we're very excited to have her on. Um, so just a quick review of the rest of the week. Tomorrow we have Vaughn Mays and Taylor Moses, uh, their community uh, organizers that are coming on from the Community Task Force Milwaukee. Um, and the topic will be Milwaukee protests and grassroots organizing. So they're going to give us some updates on that. Um, and that being said, I'd like to introduce Marlena Jackson, the current interim commissioner of the Public Health Department. Hi, Mar Marlena. Hi, thank you so much for having me. How are you all? Yeah, for sure. It's our pleasure to have you on. Um, definitely, it's been a... Uh, an interesting ride with COVID-19 so far and um, you know numbers are at their highest peak. Um, we 
have been through this journey with Commissioner Kowalik, and now we hope to continue this journey with you to give us these updates um, possibly once a month moving forward. Um, so uh, if you want, you since it's your first time on here, uh, we'd love to get a background of you and you know your experience so far. And I know that you uh, have been working in the um, community um, health department sector. Um, and you know, let us know like what's your point of view through through that department regarding COVID. Um, you go ahead. You know, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much. <clears throat> so um, I'm Marlena Jackson. I've actually been at the health department, so with the city of Milwaukee since April. And my um, my permanent role at the city will be the deputy commissioner of community health. So that's the role that um, I entered into in April um, under uh, Dr. Kowalik. Uh, there are four deputy commissioners. Um, and so I'm uh, the deputy commissioner over community health. So when she gave us her, her sad news <laughs> that she um, was moving Moving on and uh, moving up to DC, um, I was happy to um, take the role of interim commissioner um, in the midst of this pandemic. So uh, I think you described this road as being interesting, and I would absolutely agree with that, that it's been interesting, but it's also been pretty bumpy. Um, lots of potholes in the road. Um, so um, overall, we're um, I'm I'm excited to be in the role. My um, background is in public administration and healthcare administration. So before I came to the city, um, I spent um, uh, the last 15 or so years at Freighter Hospital, working in various leadership roles there. So um, since I've been into the in the interim role um, here at the city of Milwaukee, um, which just started uh, September 8th, uh, 22nd, excuse me. So just a little over. Almost, almost eight weeks now, uh, or excuse me, six weeks. So, um, just uh, again, uh, been very, very interesting and learning a lot. But I think one of the things in regards to um, COVID that I, I want to share um, is that what it's interesting that we continue um, to see, you know, continued spikes, um, regardless of of things that as public health. And as individual healthcare providers, we're trying to get out to the community. So as it relates to community um, engagement and um, community health at the health department, we are trying our best to define that and then move forward in it. So um, part of my role, again, as the Deputy Commissioner of Community Health was to create that framework. Um, obviously, all of that has been impacted um, by COVID. And I think one of the silver linings of this entire pandemic will be that we will come out of it with lots of really good relationships um, with lots of community partners as well as other um, partners in other business sectors. So that will be something that as we as we look back, we will say we met and had the opportunity to work with individuals that we might not have had otherwise. And we were able to partner um, with plans and um, with work processes that overall impacted COVID-19 and then obviously impacted health um, overall for the people that we serve. Of course. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I, I do agree with you. It has built a lot of relationships, even for SOC, we're reaching out and, um, you know, collaborating with organizations that we didn't think we would before. Um, our Communication with the public health department has definitely increased. Um, you know, we're now partners with you guys for this forum and for um, the environmental health department regarding lead exposure. Um, and, you know, Claire also comes on here and gives us an update and it's always uh, amazing seeing her. Uh, so that being said, um, I know that you are in the community health uh, aspect of you know COVID-19 and how we were going to approach this from the very beginning but like you said I feel like it has increased our willingness to collaborate with one another but it's also exposed a lot of data about all of the disparities that do exist um, within Milwaukee itself. Do you have more to talk about that? To say that yeah yeah yeah, absolutely. And uh, that was one of the um, we were city of Milwaukee was um, one of the 
uh, we were the first health department to declare racism as a public health crisis. And what that really means, you know, um, people hear declaration, but what that really means when we talk about the work that we do is a perfect example is COVID. So when COVID, um, when we, when the pandemic first began back in April, um, when you make a declaration around racism, it means that you're paying attention to underserved, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, underrepresented populations um, as a part of the natural work that you do. So when we first started getting data specific to COVID, who, who was getting COVID and who was dying from COVID, we were able to pull that information. And so initially in the pandemic, um, our African, in the city of Milwaukee, our African-American population um, had significantly higher numbers of both disease burden and of hospitalizations and of death. So um, mm -hmm. right away in the beginning, um, that's what we've seen. Over time though, what we have seen um, is a transition to those positive case numbers being transitioned over to the Hispanic um, population in the city of Milwaukee um, and most um, geographically, obviously in the Southern part of the city. And um, that particular trend has continued for a long time. So since about early um, July or so, uh, or yeah, early July, um, we've seen the um, numbers of Hispanic individuals as it really, as it compares to African-American and non-Hispanic whites um, be at a higher number. And right. so that is something that is concerned and it stayed that way throughout for month after month after month. Um, mm -hmm. And as, as our numbers have increased um, overall, I mean, exponentially, all of those particular categories have increased, um, but we're still trying to figure out what there within the Hispanic community is, is having those numbers sustained um, at increasing numbers. Right, um, and to piggyback off of what you just said, um, SOC is actually, we've a, we're actually doing, um, some research with a lot of the Latino OAX community right now. Um, we just finished a bunch of action groups or focus groups um, with a lot of um, about 50 individuals within the community. And we've gathered data um, trying to essentially understand why the Latino OAX community is not following the uh, CDC COVID-19 guidelines. Um, and we'll definitely be sharing that with you guys in the near future. Um, and it's really interesting information that we gathered. A lot of it has been um, more of a cultural aspect to why there hasn't been a behavior change. And then we've also found um, it's a lot of um, ignorance that has a lot to do with it as well. Um, but we can talk about that another day. Um, so for right now, um, the current, um, can you, you know, the current COVID-19 numbers are in the hot spots of the 53215 and 53204 zip codes. Um, has that increased in the past, you know, two, two weeks? Yeah, so what we've seen generally um, is um, most of our zip codes are increasing. We have very, excuse me, um, yeah, zip codes. Most of our zip codes are increasing, some of them more than others, but we've consistently seen 53215 and 53204 specifically increase. Um, again, now some, some weeks are less than others, but there's been consistent increase. Okay. And, and the other thing I... Oh, Go ahead. I was just going to share. And the other thing I think um, we have to note when we do talk about um, what behaviors do we see and why do we see certain behaviors, we understand that certain things are unavoidable, um, whether it's that we have to go to work or our children have to go to school or the daycare or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to understand what we can do within the constraints of that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, because a lot of um minority populations don't have the luxury of working from home like me and you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So a lot of cases, you know, especially in the 53215 and 53204 zip codes, we are seeing um, a lot of individuals do work in factory jobs and they are essential workers. And so they have to go in and um, do that. And a lot of these factories are not giving, um, you know, proper compensation for, you know, yeah. oh, if, if I am sick, you know, should I stay home? Well, if I stay home, I'm not going to get paid. 
so there's that um that's definitely a barrier that's and it's, it's yeah and it's very real i mean it's you know it's as real as it gets right like i have to make a choice of do i go to work or and if i do you know or if i don't if i'm staying home because i'm because i have a sniffle or whatever am i uh, do am i going to lose my job i think that is a real real concern mm -hmm. um and i can tell you at the health department we're trying our best to work with um with our mayor's office and with the department of um neighborhood services to see what programs we can do um to incentivize individuals to stay home whatever that might look like so we're mm -hmm. we're doing our best to think outside of the box some of that thinking takes uh we get really good ideas and then there's lots of um processes to go through to get to some loose to some solutions but um it, it definitely again it's as real as it gets when we have to make life decisions like that definitely yes uh what phase is milwaukee currently in so for our order um we're in what's um what we're calling 4.2 so we've had phase one two three and four and now we're in 4.2 of that phase um and what that means is basically um there are different capacity limits depending on where you where you um, might work or where you might visit. So there's um, capacity limits for salons. There's capacity limits for bars and restaurants. Um, overall, though, uh, while the the order is meant to to um, drive behavior from a business perspective, um, but really for the for kind of the sake of this conversation to share that also what is really important is that we're making individual decisions to the best of our ability to stay away from crowds to stay away from large gatherings and to decrease our frequency of when and where we go places so i can tell you i was a big walmart fan and i'd be at walmart every saturday before the pandemic happened and now i go to walmart as infrequently as like i think i've been like two or three times since the pandemic so even just those little decisions to say, do I really need to go to this particular place today or can I wait another week? That makes a difference. Right. No, definitely. Um, how is Wisconsin doing compared to other states in the U.S.? Oh, so Wisconsin, um, I did not look today, but when I looked um, earlier this week, we were number five in the country. So that's the fifth highest rate of um, COVID-19 positivity cases in the country. And that's down from three. About a month ago, we were number three. At the end of the day, that means we're in the top 5% of COVID-19 cases. And that is scary, um, especially when you think about the travel that happens between, for example, Milwaukee and the surrounding suburbs, um, the surrounding suburbs as it relates to other areas in the state. Um, it is it is a scary number. And I, I believe the um, positivity rate was 35 percent for the state this week. That is that is an alarming number. Wow. And uh, can you explain to our our viewers what it's supposed to be? What what's like the the best? No, uh, so, percentage? Yeah, good question. So um, what we would want to see for positivity rate is 5 percent. And what that means is 5 percent of the individuals that are tested are um, showing up as positive. Um, so right now the city of Milwaukee is at 17%. The county I believe is a little more, maybe 18 or 19, just a, a tad bit higher. But again, the state is um, in the 30s. And so um, again, as ideally, if we were able to, you know, when, we were, when we're able to say, we wanna get back to normal, we wanna do everything that we used to do, that number is gonna have to be between um, at, at at least 5% and ideally under three. Where did you see um, there was the largest spike in the past few months? I know Halloween definitely was a huge um, contributor to our spike. Um, do you think that was it or has it been just gradually changing? Yeah, we've actually seen, so every holiday brings its own challenge. So every holiday since this pandemic, um, two to four weeks after that holiday, we do see some type of spike. And we mm -hmm. did see that as well with Halloween. Um, however, the um, increase that we started to see happened really around the first week or second week of September. So it happened in September where we started to see very um, small increases, something to just pay attention to. 
Um, and then we hit pretty much um, mid October, even a little bit before Halloween, but mid October is where we started to see that drastic increase. Oh, and, wow. it, and it happened so fast, um, much, much faster than the past increases um, that again, it, it, I think it took us really um, by surprise as public health um, professionals who had seen a more gradual increase in that first wave back in July. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, so what do you suggest is the right procedure someone should take if they're hosting a gathering this Thanksgiving? Uh, what should the guests do? What should the host do? Uh, you know, we do recommend social distancing and not being around each other. But according to the CDC, um, there's a procedure that you can take in order to move forwards um, if you do want to have to host a small gathering, even though it's not recommended. Um, you know, we know a lot of people are going to be doing it and it's inevitable at this it's not inevitable, but like, you know, it's really hard to convince others not to gather, um, especially for Thanksgiving during this time. It is a personal choice not to gather, you know, a lot of individuals. Um, it's been a huge trend on social media to just eat your Thanksgiving dinner through through a Zoom call, you know, do a Zoom call with your friends or, and family and just sit there and you know, hang out, you'll probably have more conversation than actually being in person, <laughs> um, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so so the individuals will be gathering. For those that will be hosting a gathering, what should they do? Yeah, so again, just to repeat, at this point, we don't think it is safe or it is high risk to be in any group that does not live in your home. So whoever you live with is the safest place to be for Thanksgiving. If you have decided that you are going to have a gathering, you're right. The CDC put out um, some general guidelines around how to stay safe. And those guidelines include absolutely that social distancing. I think it's going to be cold next week. So the idea of being outside might or might not be easy. Um, but I but ideally, anything outside is going to be safer and less risky than anything inside. So if you have, you know, areas where you can set up a fire pit and be outside, that's going to be a safer activity. And then also, um, if you for individuals who are serving, um, they should be looking at one person serving multiple plates if that has to happen. And then mm -hmm. also using disposable um, silverware, disposable plates. That, so there's not this um, going back and forth. So it's using one server, having that distance between you and then disposable um whether again, disposable utensils, disposable plates are all things that can layer on safety, knowing that the, again, the activity alone at this point is risky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it is not recommended to do that. But for those that are going to be going and gathering, those are your guidelines. Um, I did also read that if you as the guest will be going to someone's, you know, home or area of their home remember to get tested before you go and social like socially isolate yourself um even after you get tested you know just so you can be safe that when you do go you know 100 percent you're 100 percent sure that you did not go anywhere and interact with anyone that did have coronavirus um yeah that's a great that's a great um another step and you know the city of milwaukee health department our um, community sites um, are giving results within 24 hours 24 to 48 hours so that means if that's something you're gonna do then you would need to do that this coming saturday or monday to make sure that you're getting your result back before thursday the day of thanksgiving that thursday mm -hmm. okay so you heard her folks saturday and, and monday that's when you got to get tested um so so that being said, um, we'll talk about um, quarantining just quickly. Um, this was a question that I thought would be really important to share. Um, what is the timeline that someone should follow if they got tested for COVID-19 and they're currently quarantining? So if you um, received, so if you were in contact with someone or you have had symptoms and you went to get tested for corn, um, excuse me, you went to get tested for COVID-19, the general quarantine period is two weeks. 
So it's a 14 day quarantine. And just to be clear what quarantine is, it is, it's so hard to do, but it's so important. So quarantine means that you're not running to, you know, the gas station to get your bag of chips. You're not going to the store. Um, you're not going to work. Um, that's quarantine. And I think sometimes we think, oh, that just means we don't go to work, but we, we can quick run to the grocery store. And that's not what it means. So, um, so 14 days is the general quarantine time. Um, and f if, if you have symptoms though, um, again, you should definitely get tested. It's still 14 days, but then, um, you still want to wait, even if you're, you test negative, you still, whatever, um, interaction you're going to be having moving forward, you want to wait for 24 to 48 hours after those symptoms resolve to go back into your um, normal activities that you were doing prior. Right, um, I I have some friends actually that have been tested positive for COVID-19 and they have um, been socially isolating in their home, um, but they did receive a call from the um, National Guard Public Health Department um, telling them that or I, I believe it was one of their doctors. Um, they stated that if you have been, you know, if you're asympt, the individual was asymptomatic and she was isolating in her room. Um, but then after seven to eight, nine days, um, her doctor informed her that informed her that if you do not have any symptoms, then it's okay for you to leave the home. Is that um, is that a proper routine that usually happens, or can you speak more on that? Just so yeah. clarify any you know misconceptions that ha happen, or just to clarify what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So um, so the general the general 14 day quarantine is an industry best practice. So that's looking at all of the um, factors that could and could not happen in your. Um, and possibly contracting COVID-19 and where they say it's safest. So 14 days is the safest. With that being said, depending on when your symptoms started versus when you get a test can make the difference in how your medical provider decides mm -hmm. to, um, to treat you. So for example, there are individuals, and we hear about it all the time, who let's just say started had symptoms on a Monday, but didn't really think it was um, COVID-19. And so they didn't go to the doctor until Friday. So they get their test on a Friday and let's say, oh, on Friday they tested positive. So in that case, they really probably had that disease burden for, for longer than Friday. They probably had it since at least Monday. Mm -hmm. And so that 14 days is in there still, but it doesn't feel like 14 days if you test it on Friday, because then it might be a little shorter because they're going from the beginning of your symptoms versus the beginning of the test. So absolutely listen to your providers. They they understand and know the standards as well. Mm -hmm. Um and it and working with your provider just gives you more personal care mm -hmm. to that to that point. Mm -hmm. So definitely um you know if you do test positive um you know if you do test positive from one of the sites like at the um, Miller Park if you do test positive um and you have questions definitely reach out to your provider. They can give you more of a one-on-one -on, -one on what you should be doing um, versus, you know, estimating it yourself or, right. you know, like just thinking like, oh, okay, well, I feel fine now I can leave, right? Yeah. Um, and if they're tested at one of those sites, Miller Park, um, Southside Health Center or um, uh, Northwest Health Center, they're going to if they're positive, they're going to get a call anyway from a public health nurse at the city health department. Okay. So they'll be able to walk them through those exact same guidelines um, and give them, obviously, again, that that really specific and personal guidance. Right. Right. OK, thank you. I did not know that. Um, and do you want to speak about. Um, what contact tracing is really quickly for those that do test positive. Yeah, so this, I'm so happy you brought this up because this is where we need help. We need help from the community um, and for individuals who have tested positive for COVID. So um, when an individual tests positive for COVID, again, that information comes to the city health department and it goes to one of our public health nurses. Our public health nurse would call that individual and say, hey, 
We understand that you have tested. We got your results. You've tested positive for COVID. Let's talk about what that means for you. So you need to isolate what that means. Do you have everything you need for the next two weeks? Mm -hmm. um, kind of conversations. And then they're going to say for the last two weeks, who have you come in contact with for um, for longer than 15 minutes, less than six feet apart? So that could be whoever individuals that you worked with. It could be individuals. Um, in your, um, you know, in your circles or your bubbles. And so um, typically what the health department would do is say, OK, well, give me those names and numbers and we're going to call those people. And what we're now asking, because our cases are so high, our caseload is so high, is for individuals who have tested positive to call those people. So we're going to say, who were you around? And you're going to say, I was around person A and person B and person C. And we're going to say, can you call person A and B and C? and tell them that they have been exposed to COVID-19 and they need to quarantine. Mm. And if okay. there are concerns with that, then absolutely the health department will help with that. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, last question before I let you go. Um, what, sure. is, <laughs> what is the difference between having flu, cold, or COVID-19 symptoms? What is it that so, can pinpoint COVID-19? Oh, that's such a good question. They are so very similar. Um, some mm -hmm. of the basic um, some of the basic symptoms that are the same are your sore throat, your cough, um, extreme cough, fever. Those are things that are very similar. Um, some trouble with breathing, depending on if you have other comorbidities. But um, those are very similar in flu and COVID-19. And the fact is, is that it's very difficult to tell. Um, symptoms that are very particular to COVID-19 are the loss of smell and um, taste that yeah. we continue to see. Um, and sometimes some pers persistent headaches that might not always be there with the actual flu. So if, um, if you are having any of those symptoms, even if you think it's the flu, we want you to get tested. Because the difference between COVID-19 and the flu when you have it is there's a higher percentage of people who die from COVID-19 that, that don't necessarily die from the flu. And mm -hmm. so it's a much riskier disease if you get it. Mm -hmm. And that's important because you should get tested anyway because yep. you never know what the future holds. You know, you might need that verification in the coming years you know if you had COVID-19 you'll get compensation yes. or um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, something like that or if you know um you don't know you have COVID-19 and suddenly you start to get all these symptoms and then you get hospitalized um you know it's important for you to have record of that um you never know if you're going to you know start developing breathing issues and then you need to go to the doctor um, there's a procedure you need to follow before even going to the emergency room. You know, mm -hmm. you need to call your primary physician and let them know what's happening. They can definitely advise you, but before even going to the emergency room, it's good to call the emergency room before you're going to go so they can have everything prepped for you and ready the mm -hmm. minute you walk in um, right. versus coming in and sitting in the waiting room. And then that way you'll, you're exposing everybody else around you. Um, so that is all that we have for you guys today. We shared some important links. So, uh, in the comment section, you will see the, uh, Milwaukee public health department, COVID-19 site there. You'll find, um, the map of, you know, where all the hotspots are and where, how much, uh, COVID-19 cases are in each zip code. And then you'll also find, you know, the number of deaths, the total number of COVID cases so far. And then you'll also see here that we um, included uh, an email. Um, I don't know if they put it in. Um, yeah, I believe you can email cehadmin at milwaukee.gov. That's an email address. You can definitely um, email if you see any businesses or um, any individual, any 
you know, small business is not complying to the COVID-19 regulations. Yep. Um, you know, you see people not wearing masks, you see uh, huge gatherings and they're not socially distancing. Definitely send an email to that email address with the location and of the facility that you saw and then include a description of what, you know, CDC guidelines they're not following. That way we can have someone I said we. That way, the public health department. We're can, all in this together. Yes. Uh, that way, the public health department can go send over someone to give it a look. You know, they'll do a quick inspection and see what's happening. Um, and then we also shared an online grocery store delivery site. It's called Instacart.com. I personally used this when I was um, doing my master's degree and I don't want to go grocery shopping. I would literally just pay $7 for delivery and then it would just, all the groceries would be delivered right to my home. Um, so it's definitely really good. And then you can also ask the individual to leave your groceries on your front steps. So then that way you, you're not in contact with them at all. So they'll buy your groceries and they'll put them on your front doorsteps. And that that's a really good way um, for individuals to get their grocery store uh, groceries uh, without leaving the house, especially if they have to quarantine. Um, that's definitely a difficult thing to do while you're trying to quarantine, especially if you live by yourself. Um, so that being said, um, that is all I have for you guys for today. Marlena, do you have anything um, else to add on before we conclude? I would say what we have been saying for the last uh, eight months now, wash your hands, watch your distance, and wear a mask. <laughs> yes, yes. And also, um, we actually, uh, SOC has just become a hub with the public health department um, to distribute masks within the 53215 zip code. So um, we will be um, creating a link, a survey monkey link for you guys to register if you put in the number of masks that you would like for your household. We can definitely do a contactless drop off and leave them in your mailbox or on your front doorsteps. Um, and we'll also be distributing those to small businesses and nonprofits within the 53215 zip code. Um, so if you do need masks, we're here for you. We know they're expensive. So, yeah. Um, well, thank you, Marlena. It was really good to have you on today. I really appreciate your time and your insight. You really shared some important information that a lot of viewers are not aware of. Um, so thank, thank you. you. And we'll we'll have you on next month. Sounds Hopefully. good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Uh, it's always great to have um, someone from the public health department come on and speak about uh, this important matter regarding COVID nineteen. So that being said, I'm just gonna see who our viewers are. Who said hello? Uh, we said we have Julio. He said, hello, Charlie, hello. Um, who else? Let's see. All right, those are all of our hellos, but we love to hear any feedback um, from you guys. You can complete our SOC survey, which was put in the comments as well. We love to have at least five individuals complete those for every forum. Um, and so now we're going to play a really important coronavirus video that I think really explains how COVID-19 works. Um, it's, an, it's an animated video, so it keeps you really engaged, but it also explains COVID-19 from the beginning all the way to your the symptoms that you will get all the way to any adverse effects that will come with COVID-19 even after you feel better. So we'll have that right now. In December 2019, the Chinese authorities notified the world that a virus was spreading through their communities. In the following months, it spread to other countries, with cases doubling within days. This virus is the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome-related Coronavirus 2 that causes the disease called COVID-19 and that everyone simply calls coronavirus. 
what actually happens when it infects a human and what should we all do? A virus is really just a hull around genetic material and a few proteins, arguably not even a living thing. It can only make more of itself by entering a living cell. Corona may spread via surfaces, but it's still uncertain how long it can survive on them. Its main way of spreading seems to be droplet infection, when people cough or if you touch someone who's ill and then your face, say rubbing your eyes or nose. The virus starts its journey here and then hitches a ride as a stowaway deeper into the body. Its destinations are the intestines, the spleen or the lungs, where it can have the most dramatic effect. Even just a few coronaviruses can cause quite a dramatic situation. The lungs are lined with billions of epithelial cells. These are the border cells of your body, lining your organs and mucosa, waiting to be infected. Corona connects to a specific receptor on its victim's membranes to inject its genetic material. The cell, ignorant of what's happening, executes the new instructions, which are pretty simple, copy and reassemble. It fills up with more and more copies of the original virus until it reaches a critical point and receives one final order, self-destruct. The cell sort of melts away, releasing new corona particles, ready to attack more cells. The number of infected cells grows exponentially. After about 10 days, millions of body cells are infected and billions of viruses swarm the lungs. The virus has not caused too much damage yet, but Corona is now going to release a real beast on you, your own immune system. The immune system, while there to protect you, can actually be pretty dangerous to yourself and needs tight regulation. And as immune cells pour into the lungs to fight the virus, Corona infects some of them and creates confusion. Cells have neither ears nor eyes. They communicate mostly via tiny information proteins called cytokines. Nearly every important immune reaction is controlled by them. Corona causes infected immune cells to overreact and yell bloody murder. In a sense, it puts the immune system into a fighting frenzy and sends way more soldiers than it should, wasting its resources and causing damage. Two kinds of cells in particular wreak havoc. First, neutrophiles, which are great at killing stuff, including ourselves. As they arrive in their thousands, they start pumping out enzymes that destroy as many friends as enemies. The other important type of cells that go into a frenzy are killer T-cells, which usually order infected cells to commit controlled suicide. Confused as they are, they start ordering healthy cells to kill themselves too. The more and more immune cells arrive, the more damage they do and the more healthy lung tissue they kill. This might get so bad that it can cause permanent, irreversible damage that leads to lifelong disabilities. In most cases, the immune system slowly regains control. It kills the infected cells, intercepts the viruses trying to infect new ones, and cleans up the battlefield. Recovery begins. The majority of people infected by corona will get through it with relatively mild symptoms. But many cases become severe or even critical. We don't know the percentage because not all cases have been identified, but it's safe to say that there is a lot more than with the flu. In more severe cases, millions of epithelial cells have died, and with them, the lung's protective lining is gone. That means that the alveoli, tiny air sacs via which breathing occurs, can be infected by bacteria that aren't usually a big problem. Patients get pneumonia, respiration becomes hard or even fails, and patients need ventilators to survive. The immune system has fought at full capacity for weeks and made millions of antiviral weapons. And as thousands of bacteria rapidly multiply, it is overwhelmed. They enter the blood and overrun the body. If this happens, death is very likely. The coronavirus is often compared to the flu, but actually, it's much more dangerous. While the exact death rate is hard to pin down during an ongoing pandemic, we know for sure that it's much more contagious and spreads faster than the flu. There are two futures for a pandemic like Corona, fast and slow. Which future we will see depends on how we all react to it in the early days of the outbreak. A fast pandemic will be horrible and cost many lives. A slow pandemic will not be remembered by the history books. The worst case scenario for a fast pandemic begins with a very rapid rate of infection because there are no countermeasures in place to slow it down. Why is this so bad? 
In a fast pandemic, many people get sick at the same time. If the numbers get too large, healthcare systems become unable to handle it. There aren't enough resources like medical staff or equipment like ventilators left to help everybody. People will die untreated. And as more healthcare workers get sick themselves, the capacity of healthcare systems falls even further. If this becomes the case, then horrible decisions will have to be made about who gets to live and who doesn't. The number of deaths rises significantly in such a scenario. To avoid this, the world, that means all of us, needs to do what it can to turn this into a slow pandemic. A pandemic is slowed down by the right responses, especially in the early phase, so that everyone who gets sick can get treatment and there's no crunch point with overwhelmed hospitals. Since we don't have a vaccine for corona, we have to socially engineer our behavior to act like a social vaccine. This simply means two things. Not getting infected and not infecting others. Although it sounds trivial, the very best thing you can do is to wash your hands. Soap is actually a powerful tool. The coronavirus is encased in what is basically a layer of fat. Soap breaks that fat apart and leaves it unable to infect you. It also makes your hands slippery, and with the mechanical motions of washing, viruses are ripped away. To do it properly, wash your hands as if you've just cut up some jalapenos and want to put in your contacts next. The next thing is social distancing, which is not a nice experience, but a nice thing to do. This means no hugging, no handshakes. If you can stay at home, stay at home to protect those who need to be out for society to function, from doctors to cashiers or police officers. You depend on all of them. They all depend on you to not get sick. On a larger level, there are quarantines, which can mean different things from travel restrictions or actual orders to stay at home. Quarantines are not great to experience and certainly not popular but they buy us and especially the researchers working on medication and vaccination crucial time. So if you are put under quarantine, you should understand why and respect it. None of this is fun, but looking at the big picture, it is a really small price to pay. The question of how pandemics end depends on how they start. If they start fast with a steep slope, they end badly. If they start slow with a not so steep slope, they end okayish. And in this day and age, it really is in all of our hands, literally and figuratively. A huge thanks to the experts who helped us on short notice with this video, especially Our World in Data, the online publication for research and data on the world's largest problems and how to make progress solving them. Check out their site. It also includes a constantly updated page on the corona pandemic. Um, I was saying, all right, I always love that video. I think I've seen it like eight times and I've shared it to literally all my friends and family members because it's so fun and engaging to watch, but you're also getting educated on what COVID-19 is and how we can, you know, fix this pandemic. So that being said, um, we're going to share a civic video for you today. Um, it's um, explaining the legislative branch. There are three branches of government in the U.S. Legislative, executive, and judicial. The legislative branch is comprised of the United States Congress, the bicameral legislature responsible for writing and passing all federal laws, among various other functions. Back when the Founding Fathers drafted the Constitution, debate stirred over the type of legislature they'd have. One with equal representation, i.e. the same number of representatives for each state, or a proportional representation, in which the number of representatives reflected the size of each state's population. Unable to choose, they settled on both. A legislative branch with two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate, which together formed the Congress. This was all outlined in Article I of the Constitution, which also notes the functions, powers, and parameters of the Congress and its individual representatives. A congressman's primary responsibilities include representing the interests of their constituents, working together to write laws, 
overseeing other government agencies and passing bills. But of course, that's all way easier said than done. To understand how it all works, we have to take a closer look at the makeup of the two distinct houses. The first and lower house is the House of Representatives, made up of 435 elected officials. Each state is allotted a number of congressmen, determined by their total population. To become a member of the House, one must be at least 25, have lived in the U.S. for seven years, live in the state they will represent, and be elected by the people. Congressmen serve two-year terms and are up for re-election every even year. The House is led by the Speaker of the House, who's elected by the House of Representatives. The House has a few exclusive powers not shared by the Senate. Only the House can initiate tax laws and spending bills. Only the House can initiate impeachment of the president or other government officials. And in the event that there's no majority in the Electoral College for one of the presidential candidates, it's the House who casts the deciding vote. The Senate, or the upper house, is made up of only 100 elected members, with two senators from each state. Here, a state like Wyoming has as strong a voice as California, even though California has a much larger population. To run for Senate, one must be at least 30 years old, have lived in the U.S. for nine years, and live in the state that they will represent. Senators serve six-year terms. Every even year, a third of the Senate is up for re-election. Before the 17th Amendment was ratified in 1912, senators were elected by the state legislatures, but now they're elected by us, the people. The Vice President of the United States serves as the head of the Senate, but he or she may only cast a vote in the event of a tie. The Senate exclusively has the power to approve presidential appointments and treaties. And when the House moves to impeach a government official, it's the Senate that tries them. Together, both houses have the power to tax, coin money, declare war, and regulate foreign and interstate commerce. But Congress's bread and butter is writing and passing bills. Getting a bill passed is no easy task. A bill can originate in either the House or the Senate. But before it gets voted upon, it goes through a series of committees and amendments and floor debates. After a vote, it moves to the other chamber and the process continues. If the one chamber makes any edits to a bill passed by the other, it has to go back for another vote. The House and Senate must vote to approve the exact same bill before it can move on. If it fails to get a majority vote, it has to be reintroduced. If it passes, it goes to the president's desk for approval. If the president chooses to veto a bill, which essentially voids it, Congress can push back with a veto override. But to do this, they need a two-thirds majority vote in both houses. Failing to pass legislation is an inevitable part of congressional routine. Congress is the only branch of government whose members are elected directly by the people, and the only part of government that tries to balance the relationship between the power of the nation and the individual states. To see how the Supreme Court checks the president, check out our video on the judicial branch. All right, uh, what a great video to learn about the legislative branch. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our SOC feature for today, which includes um, Andrea, and she's going to be interviewing our UWM interns that have been working with us. Um, and uh, she's going to get their thoughts and perspectives and kind of see what their experience has been. Hi, Marlene. Hi, How are you? Good, good. Uh, you can take the floor from here. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Rodriguez. I'm the leadership coordinator for Southside Organizing Center. Um, today, we're going to have on our interns that we can bring on just a moment. And they come from UW Milwaukee with our partnership with the Center of Community Based Learning. So we have Gretchen, we have Aria, and we have Peyton. Hi. Hi, Hi. everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Good. Yeah. You are three individuals I'm so thankful for, but I've never actually met in person because this is the first time we've ever had digital organizing with our interns. So have you on the show just to share your experience today. And we'll just kind of go around. I'll have Gretchen and then Aria and then Peyton end us out. But just to give us a little bit about yourself, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your majors? Hi, I'm Gretchen. I'm a social work major. I haven't really decided what kind of social work I'm I want to get into, but I'm just testing the waters. 
Excellent. My name is Aria and I'm also a social work major at UWM and I'm a junior. My name's Peyton and I'm also a junior and my major is also social work and I'm leaning more towards child advocacy, but still looking at all of the options. Beautiful, beautiful. Let our viewers know right now what you drew you to choose SOC, Southside Organizing Center, as your internship location this year. Let me start with you, Gretchen. Uh, I never really heard of SOC, so I was really interested in seeing what would the organization was about and how it could help. Excellent, excellent. Are you from Milwaukee, Gretchen? Are you, uh, remind me where you're from. I'm from Port Washington, so not too far. Port Washington. So yeah, this is a good a good way to definitely learn about the South Side of Milwaukee for sure. What about you, Aria? Uh, I was born on the South Side, and I have family there, so I thought it'd be a good way to give back to the community. Absolutely, absolutely. What about you, Peyton? Um, I'm from Appleton, but I also like Gretchen. I had never heard of it, so I kind of just wanted to see what it was about. And it was one of the virtual options. So I thought that that would be best for me. Absolutely. I know with COVID-19, so many different things happening. It, you know, safety first is so important right now. So one thing that I am just so thankful for all three of you is that we've never done digital organizing before. Um, normally what happens is we have interns come to our center and then they would do door knocking or in-person events and it's a very cut and dry system. And this is the first time we've ever done online work. So we thank you all for helping us kind of figure this program out because really we didn't know what to expect until we actually had interns in the role. And as far as my understanding from my team, you guys did an amazing job. Why don't you guys, and we'll go around again from Gretchen, Aria to Peyton, tell us a little bit about some of the work you did and some of the experiences you had working with SOC. Uh, the first project that we were assigned was calling the residents of the South Side to make sure that they were registered for the census and also registered to vote. And then the second project, we made videos to spread the news about the COVID restrictions and how to be safe about that. And then the last project that I was a part of was packaging up masks to be distributed in the South Side. Excellent. Aria, tell me a little bit about out of those experiences, what's something that really stood out to you with your time at SOC? Um, I liked how I was able to choose when to do things. Like for the videos I filmed when I had time and the masks, it, it works around our schedule really well. Yeah, the, the other interns, it was very cut and dry office hours, but really we, we had some flexibility this time. Mm -hmm. What about you, Peyton? What's something that stood out for you for your experience? Just like always being involved. I feel like I feel like everyone's so like welcoming and just like if we don't understand it, they always help us. So I felt like it was really like nice to actually be able to like ask for help and always have someone to like talk to about it. Excellent, excellent. And for you viewers that are not familiar with service learning, what it is is taking community service and framing it around academics. So all these individuals here, um, they're social workers. We've had different majors in the past, but this happens to be a group that is mainly in social work. And anything that you guys need, whether it's having data from the South Side, or you know, we definitely have offered, like if you need any assistance with any of your projects, it's very important to SOC that not only are you helping us, but we are helping you um, because one day you're gonna have you know, your graduation and hopefully you'll come and serve on the South Side in some shape or form because we need all the help we can get, especially with COVID-19 going around. Uh, before we wrap up, if we can go around one more time from Gretchen, Aria to Peyton, anything, any thoughts you wanna share to any um, prospective interns from UW Milwaukee or any other colleges or university about coming to SOC, any, any advice to share? And at the same time, we're gonna share a link for our viewers if they wanna learn more about the UW Milwaukee program, but any advice? Um, I just be. I would just say, don't be afraid to ask for help. Everyone was super nice, super helpful, super understandable. If we needed like more clarification, so that's pretty much it. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. What about you, Aria? I agree. I would definitely recommend it. I never had any questions or anything, and if I did, I felt comfortable talking to everyone, and it was just a great experience. Good. Good. How about you, Peyton? I also agree. I think it's so nice to be able to just ask questions and like how we had meetings like every week. It was so helpful to just be like in the know of everything. 
Well, I appreciate all of you and I give you guys all just, just from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all because honestly to come into an organization that you never actually really physically interacted with during a pandemic when you all are so busy with your own education and I'm sure you're dealing with your own things going on with COVID, you know, right now it's just such a reality check for all of us. Um, you all were so consistent and so pleasant and I heard so many great things about all of your work from all of my teammates and I'm really thankful. And just so we're very clear, I know um, very soon we're done with our time with you, but we consider you family. So anytime you need anything with SOC, anytime you wanna to come to the South Side, hopefully you'll become residents of the South Side if I cross my fingers. Um, but you know, we just want you to know that this is always an open door for you and we're very thankful and very hopeful for your future. Thank you, appreciate that. Thanks. Always. All right. Gracias, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Marlene. Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Um, thank you, UWM interns. I've been working one on one with them and they've been really great. Um, they're very understanding and they get right to uh, the point. Right. They get into their work and they get it done. Um, so it was really awesome having them on. Um, you know, when we were creating the videos together and creating, I uh, thinking of like ideas, they, they were very like interested and adamant about creating the scripts. And then once they created the scripts, they were in charge of um, recording. So um, a lot of them, what well, some of them have recorded already. And um, some uh, still have some videos that they're recording today. Um, so they're still working and they're working hard for the South Side. Um, and we'll be sharing those videos once they're complete on our Facebook page. So you guys can see what um, the uh, South Side uh, UWM interns have been working on. Not only that, but um, I literally grabbed like huge boxes of masks and I delivered it to their homes and they were like, all right, we're going to put these together now. So um, they were very, um, very open to any suggestions that I had for them to work on, especially during a pandemic. Um, so, yeah, we really appreciate you guys and for helping us out with all of this work. Um, so now I'm going to um, give it to Marisol. She's going to share our survey promo. Has this live forum been informative and useful to you? What part of the forum could be improved or changed to make it better? Please take a quick survey that's located in the comments section so that we can keep 3 o'clock with SOC going for residents. Thank you for tuning in. All right. So now um, I'm going to give you guys some reminders that tomorrow we have Vaughn Mays and Taylor Moses coming on who are community organizers from the Community Task Force Milwaukee. They're gonna be talking about Milwaukee's protests and grassroots organizing updates that they have for us. And um, also, I just wanna reiterate that if you do need help right now, um, reach out to SOC and we can try to help you with any resources that we can share with you during this time. That being said, I'd leave you with our funder partner thank yous. Have a good day. Hello, Xaviers. I am Esperanza Gutierrez, a longtime resident of the near South Side. We would like to thank everyone for supporting our 3 o'clock with SAC live show and for completing our SAC survey. In addition to thanking our residents for turning in and sharing our show, we would also like to thank the following sponsors. Wisconsin Voices, Community Development Block Grant, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructural Fund, the Movement Voter Project, the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, the Silver Foundation, City of Milwaukee Office of Violent Prevention, the Tithe Foundation, the City of Milwaukee Promise Zone, and all the faithful individuals who support SAC through their personal donations. Thank you. Gracias.